Well, thank you for hanging in there, Dave. I know you're exhausted and get trying to get all these done. Yes. Um, hey, everybody, I have with me Donovan Chapman. How are you this afternoon? Doing great. Doing great, Donna. Thank you for having me on your Zoom, and um, I'm looking forward to talking with you. So I see a little car, a little oh, a little model the, car. Is that a Charger? That that is the General Lee Charger. I actually <laughs> found it. I was yeah. Hold on. <laughs> That is the generally I was actually we moved here from Kansas and um, this is uh, something I found in a thrift store and it's an actual model, the real model with the hood opens up and everything. I was like, man, I've got to have that. that what is, is, it? is that a 383 in there or a 440? <laughs> I'm not sure. It's just uh, I'm hoping it's the, the one that they had in the uh, Dukes uh, of Hazzard. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I don't remember which one. It's probably you know, I don't know. I, I'm not going to pretend I know. Um, I my first car was a, a '68 Dodge Charger. Ooh. And it was, and it had a 383. So I'm kind of partial to the 383. Those engines are, they were pretty tough. I mean, that thing, I used to be, I was bad. I was here, I was 16 years old, and I was cruising down the streets of Long Island, and I would literally race guys. I bet you beat them too. Some, some of them, yeah, some of them I beat. Yeah, absolutely. Some were. <laughs> did better than me, you know? So we're here to talk about you. So that's what we're going to do. Um, oh, well. Okay. So I'm seeing, I'm seeing all kinds of stuff about special operations, veterans class of uh, Freedom Sings USA. Yes, ma'am. Tell me what you're doing. Oh, well, I'm an artist as well as singer songwriter and uh, my yeah, own on point music group. And so, you know, I've had several record deals in the industry and charted several hit singles and um, I took some time off and spent some time recovering from combat injuries. I was in the Air Force Special Operations Pararescue Teams, and we are tasked with, we're the smallest special operations in the Department of Defense, tasked with rescuing special operations such as SEALs, Green Berets, Recon, uh, Rangers. Uh, so, and we also do a lot of uh, Special Operations Task Force, and we do SAR missions, which are civilian air rescue missions, kind of like search and rescue, oh. uh, and, and CSAR, combat search and rescue missions. And we're all Special Operations medics. We all combat dive. We all mountain climb. We, we, uh, we free fall. We jump out of every aircraft that's in the inventory. Uh, any means that it, the military has created to get from the air to the ground or from sea to ground or ground to ground we're trained in so that we can get in there and provide medical care. We carry whole blood with us and we actually are using blood transfusion kits that are person to person now on the battlefield. Um, so we're all trained up <clears throat> very high skill level. It's about a two to three year training pipeline with a 98% attrition rate. I'm lucky to have gotten through it. I look back on my life and go, how did I get through that training? I have no idea because <laughs> I couldn't do it now. Of course, I'm busted up, but um, I had those two record deals and uh, I really didn't I didn't have time to work on me when I got out of Afghanistan. I was Mike Kerb offered a record deal to me. He said, if you get back on this last tour, you'll have a seven album record deal waiting for you in a publishing deal. Mm. I was like, well, it was the Jinx tour because that's the tour I got. We had some really bad things go down. And I got injured on that tour and I come back and then I was with Kerb Records and then I went to Category 5 Records and my body was falling apart. I had to get surgery, spinal surgeries, arm reconstruction surgeries. That This hand, it's kind of deformed now. It's uh, dumb. It was really far out there. I couldn't even play guitar anymore. And yeah. uh, I had to teach myself to sing again because the scar they scarred my vocal cords doing spinal surgery. And, and I just rebound and went through the hardship of life and with PTSD, with just new, dozens of medication from the VA in me. Had the PTSD kicked in when I had time to think and I had time laying on my back for months and months and months. Mm. And I was going to college at the same time because it's I had about six months to use my GI Bill when I left Nashville. So I thought many, many of my guys didn't get a chance to go to college. They died in combat yeah. and killed in action. And so I worked on myself, went to college, uh, went through some very tough surrendering times. I went to rehabilitation for the PTSD and and the body and the medications and just absolutely falling apart. And one of the things that Bev and I really focus on is the inspirational surrender to getting help and for veterans to do that. And people in life, because everyone's pain is real. And it's not like, oh, veterans, you guys go through so much more. We go through things in a different way, but everybody in life I feel is tested. Um, I think that's just the pathway laid before each and every one of us. And so now I've come and I've came back and worked on the album Brotherhood, some of the songs from the album Brotherhood, 
uh, were written in rehabilitations with another Marine, two of the songs, Revelation Change and Two Veterans, uh, with Mark Rowe, who was down there wow. dealing with his dysfunctions as well. And, um, and we wouldn't say it's our dysfunction, we wouldn't say it's our, our issues with life. It's when we're broken, you know, and you got to be man or human enough to realize it, the true strength comes from walking through the fear of what you may think is weakness so that you can identify and investigate it and work on it. And I always tell people, um, the zero, say a zero horizontal median line, if you go down negative 30 in life, such as being in combat, being busted up and you're self-medicating and you're drinking and you're dealing with your issues because, and you got pills on top of it from the VA and you're injured and you're in body pain, mental pain. Mm -hmm. um, when you go above that zero line, you go plus 30. And now you're a leader in life. And because to understand how to help people and to help yourself, you've got to go through the darkness to see the light. Um, and I stand for that with veterans. So now being that brotherhood started from rehabilitations and I worked on that album. It's a lot of military songs in there, spiritual songs. I'm very respectful to any, anyone's spiritual belief. I'm respectful to anyone's belief of what they want to believe uh, as long as they're not hurting others or hurting themselves. Um, now I'm, you know, I'm native Hawaiian and Cajun. So I come from a mix of culture, um, and I've learned to live with that. And so I keep an open mind and that's what I'm about. And this album is a humanitarian inspirational album. And so at the same time, uh, Mr. Don Goodman and Bobby Standifer and Steve Dean, you might've heard of Mr. Don Goodman, and Steve Dean, the Stown writers in Nashville. Mm -hmm. Mr. Don wrote Old Red for Blake Shelton, Angels Among Us for Alabama. And Steve wrote Watching You for Rodney Atkins, Roundabout Way for George Strait. These are just a few of their number one hits. Right. And they heard Brotherhood, the album title song. And they contacted me and said, man, we would love to have you with Freedom Sings USA writing with us with this nonprofit th veterans therapy program. Wow. So I came into the program and I hadn't released my album yet. That didn't happen until October 29th of 21. Mm -hmm. And so I was watching and I was like, wow, they had a, I was participating in a general Wednesday class. And it's it's all military, just you know. But one of the things I wasn't seeing, and they're doing a great job. I mean, Don Goodman is a is a genius at writing, one of the best writers I've ever known, right. and the industry has ever known. And Steve working alongside him, and Bobby Standifer, one of the co-founders. And I and I was participating for a few months, and I asked them. I said, you know, I'm not seeing any special operations. And they will talk to us. What what you, what do you mean by that? And I was like, well, less than two percent of the Department of Defense is special operations and special operations has a 50 percent higher suicide rate 50 percent right. higher paraplegic quadriplegic and ptsd problems because those are the guys and men and women who are going in and doing things that is unconventional um it's nothing the, against the most animals. dangerous the most it, dangerous it 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 i would say it's most dangerous in a collective way of most of the time Yes. Uh, because all military are going to be put in a very dis dangerous situation, but special operations is special ops. You're trained to the ultimate level to be in the danger zone at all times. Uh, yeah. Uh, and so, and so he, they said, well, why don't you start your own class, Donovan? I said, all right, we're going to start the special operations veterans class. And Mr. Don goes, well, you're leading it. And I went, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so Don backs me up in it and, and gives me the support to do this. And, I brought in um, Gold Star family parents, Jackie and Red Cunningham, the parents of Jason Cunningham, my troop who was killed in action on Operation Anaconda and received the Air Force Cross that was knocked down for the Medal of Honor. He was also on the same mission as John Chapman, who received the Medal of Honor, and they've got a big movie coming out in California on him next year. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've written with a lot of my teammates and fellow Marine Recon brothers. We've got... Uh, combat controllers in there from the Air Force um, who call for fire missions and do a lot of special ops missions. We got the, our fellow pararescuemen in there. And what we've seen is, is to um, to get, my concept was, is to get them talking to trust into the program. Um, and being in special operations myself, it, it gives a layer of trust to these veterans to go, okay, now we're gonna get deep in your mind. We're gonna go to the trauma. But what I'm gonna do is, is it's gonna be on paper so that 
And, and it's a gentle way of doing this in these class writing sessions so that they can see their story on paper. Now, this is the first step that a person can do to awareness to, to healing yeah. is to get it out of their head. Because how can you just sit here and live with something in your head unless you become the observer? To become the observer of your trauma, sometimes it has to be out in front of you. And then we delicately, and as we're writing, we're scribing, Miss Bobby standard for scribing away on everything the veteran's saying, and it's all confidential. Mm -hmm. And then Don and I are extracting material and going, grab that, grab that, grab that. And then it starts just coming to us. We'll write the song in two different two hour sessions. Right. Um, and it's it happens very cool working with Mr. Don. We really work well together, old and young. And if he hears this, I hope he doesn't mean I'm saying he's old because he's a he's a he's a young man in his 70 year old body, but he's a great <laughs> yeah, he's, he's a young soul. He's a young, young yeah, soul. He's, yeah, he's awesome. So we it gives them a therapy and a, and we walk them through the trauma and get we put as much as their words and their story into the song, how they're saying it, and then I build the melody to it and we write this and through the end of the song, we give them a roadmap out of the song to healing. Mm -hmm. um, yes, such as one we've been writing with a teammate of mine, Brent and Manny, who was dealing with, uh, broke his back in the military, went to, oh, you know, the ego got a hold in the bottle one and he was dealing with the ongoing battle of love and fear and he couldn't hold his family. He was solitude all the time. And so we turned it to the end of the song. The Now I'm holding my family near the ongoing balance of love and fear. And so that gives him a way to accept himself. It gives him therapy and a roadmap mm -hmm. out. And they feel appreciated that someone took the time to go through this very therapeutic program with them. So I'm very happy to be a lead songwriter and leading the class with, with Freedom Sings USA. And we're doing, I'm headlining a show at Valley Fest in Dunlap, Tennessee on May 6th. Okay. And it's a big show we're doing down there. And um, I couldn't be more happier and thankful to, you know, be doing this with this nonprofit and to have my album out there doing well. And I think we're uh, over four weeks right now in the Billboard Indicator charts in the top 60. Um, and our streaming is doing well and our management team is really working hard on getting them information out there about the album Brotherhood. Um, and I've got some great friends, fellow artists as well. Mr. Eddie Montgomery is very close to me and he's brought me on the road just sometimes just to be a brother and sit down and relax with him and just feel good around his team. Um, and so artists like that, like Eddie Montgomery and Eddie K. Kilgallen, who was in Ricochet, who's his band leader tour manager now, those right. guys are heaven sent. They're doing to me what I'm helping other guys do. Right. Um, there's great people in this industry. And, you know, I didn't really see a whole lot of that before when I was on Curb and back in them days. It was really, it was different. I mean, it's, I mean, but back then they say it's harder than it's ever been now. And now everybody's saying it's harder than it's ever been. And next year, everybody will say it's harder than it's ever been. Right. But when you've got a good team and good friends mm -hmm. where there's no ego involved and there's no competition, mm -hmm. um, I mean, Eddie is not a competitive guy. I mean, I mean, he he just does his thing. And right. I always look at the only person I'm competitive with is the bad me, the one I have to keep control of. Yeah. Wow, that was a mouthful. Yeah. <laughs> that I, was amazing. I can tell that you're very, um, you've honed your craft of uh, public speaking. You really have. I mean, you, uh, yeah, I can tell that you do this, that you get in front of a group and you, and you speak and you're speaking from the heart. Uh, yes, ma'am. Well, I've been there and I've been on my knees surrendering and I was close to death when I went to rehab, I was 165 pounds and didn't even realize that I was about to die from type two diabetes. And I've got to rehab and I spent three hours in detox. I was clean, uh, but I went in and, uh, and I was sick. I was broken. I was so sick, so close to death very close to death and they found me in the woods out of my mind um so the, they took care of me and the pararescue organist foundation stepped up and paid for the rehab said we need to take care of chappy that was my nickname in pararescue chappy oh wow and, and i got down there and i saw veterans and simple people in life and millionaires in there everybody having to surrender their problems and what happened in their life so that they don't transfer the dysfunction further into their life and to understand, I mean, when we come out of the military, Donna, I think that anybody who goes through combat should have to go to this four week course. Yeah. It, we try to destigmatize this type of therapy because you, I mean, how many people out there really know that the mind, the subconscious mind doesn't know time? 
Mm. I was like, what? It doesn't know time. No, it thinks everything you're thinking is happening now. We can relate. Yeah, I know that's the past, but the way the chemical response and emotions work, it thinks everything's happening right now. Yeah. It can't tell time. So what happens from PTSD and trauma from the past and how the past becomes our present with every minute and every day? And then that invites in the victimized mentality that we cannot break. Mm. And that is such an important thing to right. have to understand. And and I, um, I think that the good Lord, um, Lord, I would say the as a Hawaiian, the Creator, mm -hmm. has put me through these things and been supportive of me, this entity of love, so that I could get through and do something and help people. My entire process as an artist is not for fame. If it would have happened to me when I was on Curb Records, I'd have fell flat on my face. I did not know how to be a civilian. I did not understand fame. I did not understand the industry. Right. I understand it very well now. And I lead my team and Bev is awesome. And my management and the people we work with, everybody's heart is about helping others. Because when we are doing that, manifestation and energy will happen and mm -hmm. you will be taken care of if you just believe. Yeah, karma. Yes, ma'am. It's very All real. Long. It's very real on that, you know. And when you surround yourself with good energy, you know, mm. yeah, it, it, it really is a team. It takes a village and that's, that's just not hyperbole. You know what I mean? It's, it's real. Um, where are you currently located? Where are you living? Sorry, I had to plug my battery in. Okay. Um, it fell out. I am living uh, outside Murfreesboro, Tennessee right now. Okay. You know where I am? You'd have no idea. Uh, is it Massachusetts? No, I'm in McMinnville, Tennessee. Oh, I was gonna say, I was gonna say, because you, you had that northern accent, you're gonna tell me, I'm, you think I'm in Tennessee, but I'm actually. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, because I have a. Well, no, I guess you wouldn't see that on the Zoom. My phone number, you wouldn't see it on the Zoom. No, ma'am. Yeah, I'm so from I'm from Long Island originally, so that's that's okay. the accent that you're hearing. Um, yeah, we have a pair of rescue team there. Actually, there's a PJ team at the Air Force Base there. Is it really? Yes, ma'am. That's well, where. What about Georgia? Because I was in Georgia for almost twelve years. Well, I was stationed in Valdosta, Georgia, for six years. That's where the thirty eighth, forty first team is. Wow. Yeah. I, I have nothing bad to say about Georgia at all. I actually loved it, but I'm also a songwriter, and my husband had a stroke twelve years ago, and we said we kind of asked this question: Do we want to die in Georgia, or do we want to go to Tennessee and live the, live our dreams? before this before the, it's too late you know you sometimes things happen again things happen for a reason so we we came to tennessee and uh he then ended up getting cancer um so you know i i can tell you about all kinds of trials and tribulations and uh he is currently cancer free uh cancer survivor awesome uh, you know and he's uh he's stable so i mean every day and we still write um i i you know i married one of my co-writers um and it's 23 years later and we're still together. So uh, it's a wonderful mm -hmm. thing. Well, how was that song you wrote together then? <laughs> the first one you wrote together? Oh, I don't even remember what the first one was. There was so many, because we wrote online. This was mm -hmm. back in AOL days. You were probably a baby. <laughs> yeah, I'm 47 now. Well, I'm 60 and he's, <laughs> I'm 60 and he's 65. So, I mean, you know, it was back with, you know, you got mail and. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, we started way back then with the You Got Mail thing, and uh, we wrote for about a year, and then, I shouldn't be telling you this story, but I'll just say it quick, and then we we kind of felt like something was happening, but you were like, when you haven't met somebody face-to-face, -face, you just don't know what's going to happen when you meet face-to-face, -face. so we finally said we have to meet and, and make sure that this is love before, you know, we, we either waste any more time on it or, you know, whatever, and we met, and, and it was love, and so we met like in January of 98 and we were married on July 10th of 98. So that it was is pretty beautiful. Cool. Yeah, it, it's, a beautiful. It, it's a beautiful story. I mean, we have we have a lot of music out there. He has albums. Um, you know, we did the whole fanfare thing back in 1999 and 2000. And uh, when were you messing? When were you I'm say messing with Curb? When were you messing with Curb Records? Uh, 2003, I signed with Curb Records. I believe it was in um, February. It was, it was well, early, in your 20s in my 20s uh, I was in in my late 20s mm -hmm. yeah well that's you know that's that's a good age that's a good age too but so and that was before the military 
No, that was after because I, I did nearly 11 years in the Air Force. I came in at 17 in 1992, turned 18 in 92 in the Air Force, and I got out there beginning of 2003 into 2002 terminal on a leave. Um, but yeah, that's that was, uh, and I went right into Curb Records right out of Afghanistan. I still had a full beard, and I mean, because we're special ops, we're grubbing up. Right. And uh, being downrange a lot, embedded, and I um. Did you just say grubbing up? Yeah, what we call it, grubbing up, and we wear <laughs> when we wear we grow our beards out in the special ops teams and grow our hair out so that when we're downrange like that, there's for reasons reasons of respect to working with uh, in Afghanistan, working with the the people there, and it's not like you're in a city a lot of times where we're working. A lot of times we'll be working out in the field where it's just small small villages. Right. Um, and also we, we blend, right? Yeah, you we blend in and it's like camouflage. Yeah. Me being Hawaiian, I blended right in, <laughs> but yeah, it's, so it's, it's for a reason. And, um, but yeah, that, that's 11 years and it went right into the industry. And like I said, I never had time to learn how to be a civilian or learn how to process any of the trauma of what went down and all the men, I lost both of my troops. I supervised, I lost my mm. supervisor. I lost an acting commander. I lost a bunch of other brothers on the teams. And pararescue is not a very big force, less than a thousand any one time in the Air, in the Air Force ever been. Um, so it's it's very it's a 98 percent attrition rate, 98 percent attrition rate, two percent get through the training after two years of the pipeline. Either they I, get hurt uh, or they quit. My first journalistic job was um, at a place called the Long Island Veterans Times uh, yeah, yeah. in a Patchog, Long Island. And I met yeah. a lot of vets. And um, I didn't know, you know, I was, you know, I was in my 20s. I did not know that veterans felt so disrespected and so disposable when they returned back to the state. Well, a lot of the vets that I was dealing with were Vietnam vets. So yes, I'm very um, pro support, especially for all veterans, but soft spot for Vietnam vets because they are the ones I saw so, so, so emotionally damaged. Um, yes, I knew, I knew actually met veterans who were spat on when they came back from the war. Americans would be waiting for them to spit on them. Yeah, that my dad was uh, shot in Vietnam and he returned and my dad being one who deals with, uh, you know, PTSD and um, of course they'll never say it because there was no therapy for that. There was they weren't even respected. The VA system wasn't set up to even acknowledge it, really. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was called the shell shock syndrome. No one was really doing the research. The research right. wasn't there medically. Mm -hmm. And so the Vietnam veterans were just left to hang to come back, return, bow up and deal with it, deal with a country who hates you yeah. and deal with and just deal with you were drafted. You didn't have a choice. No. That, there's nothing more that that will get me in a really ticked off mood mm -hmm. if anyone has something to say about a Vietnam veteran when that man did not have a choice mm -hmm. to not go and you spit on him for going and doing what the government made him do. We, um, we, you know, so as I said, out, you know, with uh, songwriting, one of the first songs that, uh, well, our most popular song to date, and it even got picked up for a documentary called The Flag, is a song called Duty Called. And I wrote it with my husband and a woman named Bobby Sharp. And Bobby uh, had written other things. She's since passed away, but she had written other things and um, came to us with this idea because her, she knew an 18 year old named Bobby who was drafted and he went to Vietnam and he was killed in action like one year and three days after he was, after he went. Yeah. We, we, we released the album with duty called on it and Bobby passed away one year and three days. Hmm. It was like, you know, after the album was released, it was just bizarre. The time it was bizarre. It was bizarre. It is very bizarre. Wait, Anyhow, my manager. Yeah. Back, back in the day, uh, young YouTube was very young mm -hmm. and, you know, we did a music, music video for it and we put it on YouTube and uh, we had hit a million views. But what ha what had happened was YouTube decided that they were no longer going to pay monetize, monetize videos that had anything to do with war. Mm -hmm. Why not? You know, so it was like I got mad and pulled it down. Um, and then realized that I just lost all those views. 
<laughs> like like when you pull the video down, you lose all your views. Oh, no. um, it would have been a, to this day, you know, it would have been the the best. And then by the time you know when I when I I put it back up, but after I did that, so many other people because it had been on you know for a couple of years, like three or four years. Um, but there had been so much more congestion, you know, mm -hmm. m uh, other people uploading uh, videos that it just never got it never got those kind of views again. Um, however, it remains uh, probably one of our uh, most popular songs. And, uh, you know, we went on to, I wrote, I wrote another one, Second Son, and it's the song about being a second generation American and being a second son. And then another one called Purple Heart, which um, honors the, uh, the African American or the black vet. Mm -hmm. Because they, you know, people don't realize that black men went, have, how many did you have? I mean, I'm sure you know black men that were fighting for our country. Absolutely. There was, um, I have a lot of brothers who were African Americans that fought for the country. And, and to be honest with you, when I was in, uh, I, I didn't see racism. I mean, when I was in there's those 11 years and everybody that we were together with, we were brothers, man. We, we, we got along, we're in the military. And so I don't see this, this whole thing, what people are saying, there's, there's problems with this and I'm half white and I'm half Hawaiian. Right. My mother's full name. I just didn't see it. I didn't see what, you know, what the problem was, what was going on with that. Uh, and now people talk about, you, you know, well, that's happening. And I personally, you unless the military it. has done a flip change since I got out, right. I did not see that. I can tell you right now that if you were ever, you, if you ever showed any type of racism toward any race, when I was in your butt would have been kicked out in a minute and article 15 is sent out. It was right. not tolerated in the air force when I was in. Well, no, you know, what we focused on really was the fact that um, Americans, you know, people back home, not, not what was going on in the military, but about that people back home didn't don't realize that black Americans, African Americans fought for this country alongside their white brothers. That's right. Every race. And and here's another thing. There is there's there's people uh, there's Afghanistan women who became civilian or United States citizens who who just turned United States citizens who turned around and joined the military and served in the United States military and became officers and who oh, yeah. went to Afghanistan mm -hmm. and served where they were treated and their parents were you know persecuted in front of them yeah. and fought right back in the country they came from so there's people of all cultures there's people of all cultures in the military. There's people of all religions in the military. Mm -hmm. There's people, and, and I will tell you right now, and I'll stand for this every day right now moving forward, unless unless I'm told otherwise. The military, we're trained, we're, we're follow, the, we don't follow, we follow the Constitution, but we're also under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Mm -hmm. I don't see where like this, not to get into the whole, a po political thing, but you know, white supremacy in the military or a black supremacy or this or that. Mm -hmm. I, being of mixed culture, I'll tell you right now, I did not see it. Right. I did not see it. And, right. and so um, I would hope and think that the military um, with the rules and standards being the highest of our country mm -hmm. under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, that it would never get to that point. And I, and I pray that it won't. And I don't think it will. I think uh, if it does, we got a rab we got a bad problem. We yeah. got a bad problem. But there's so much split going on in, in the world right now with um, and that's where I go back to talking about broadening horizons, think with your heart, open your mind mm -hmm. and open the blinders and be because you can only think at a mindset at a time. And, you know, in a lot of ways, we only function in love or fear. Yeah. Um, and in fear mode, you're going to be pointing the finger. You're going to be afraid. You're going to be uh, looking at things a certain way. I don't listen to the news. I, re I will not listen to it's too negative for me. There's not enough yeah. positive news being reported. And I have to worry about my mental health and my health toward what goes on with this organization that I'm working with and my career so that I can help people. Um, and I feel that this world needs healing. Oh, Our country needs kidding. healing. And, and that's where I believe in my art of what we do in my team and working with freedom sings healing i get healing from working with those veterans there's been many times i get off the phone and don and i talk i know we're in tears man and he's like you sure you got this brother i mean i'm like if we don't do it who is don yeah 
The, um, I mean, who's going to do it? The VA doesn't have a funding to do something they, like no, this. No, no. Um, and, and speaking of that, too, so uh, for 16 years, I was a paralegal on Long Island. And, you know, we had all kinds of clients. And we had one particular client who was a uh, Vietnam vet. And he used to... He used to jog. He used to run down to the office, and he was—he always seemed very lighthearted, and he always seemed very happy. And um, but my boss said to me, you know, he's a lot of times he's in a very dark place. And I was like, what do you mean? Well, he's—he saw a lot of things over in Vietnam and uh, things that he has trouble living with. And I didn't really know what he meant, but I, I will tell you that um, it—you know—he the man committed suicide. Mm. And I will always remember the day I got the call that he had killed himself. And because he'd become very erratic at home. And I think his wife took the kids one day. She just couldn't handle it. And again, like you said, there was no help for them. There was no help. Um, and she she was afraid. She he, he, he had a gun and he was waving it around in the house. And she just grabbed their two girls and got got out of there uh, because she was afraid for her life and and for theirs. And, and after she left, he killed himself. And uh, it was terrible for us. It was terrible for the whole community. And, you know, that was, I never, I'm carrying this with me. Now think, I, I stopped working in law firms over 23 years ago, or approximately 23 years ago. I'm still carrying his suicide with me. Um, so I can't even imagine. And, um, you know, I think what you're doing is so powerful and it's so necessary. And, not off to go off topic, but are there any strings on those little guitars? <laughs> oh yeah, these are ukuleles. Okay. Yeah, these are. I, yep. Uh, you can't see the strings, you know, through the video. So I'm like, are they stringless? Yeah, this is a uh, this is a little ukulele. But, but I know what you're saying, Donna, because my manager actually, my manager actually, uh, his father died. Um, when he was in Vietnam, uh, before Matt, Matt was born, Matt Payne, and Aww. he was also, uh, in the special operations and, and he, um, served at a very high level, what we call a tier one level. And after, uh, his dad was in Vietnam, um, he, his mother was pregnant and his dad, did, he was killed on that tour. Aww. And so Matt never knew his father. And I'm actually writing a song for a Vietnam Memorial that they're doing in Maryland mm -hmm. in March. We're going out there to do that in Maryland, a new Vietnam Memorial. And I'm writing a song, uh, Mr. Don, I brought, I asked Mr. Don Goodman to come in and help me on it. Cause it's a very critical song and it's going to be called the dad. I didn't know. Oh, but the song's going to be about though. He's walking with me. I hear his mm -hmm. words coming out of my mouth, but you know, but it's, and it's going to, the hook is the, you know, the dad, I, the dad, I never knew. Right. Um, and so that's a song and probably will put it on my next album, but it, I want it to be a, I want it to be a, um, a song that reaches out to all those who never knew their dads, their dads never made it home when they were born after they were born. You know, right. there's, a lot of, there's a lot of dads that are watching on the, the screen, the, the birth and the mom going, here he is, here's your, yeah. here's your baby and the father going, and then days afterwards being killed. There's hundreds of these stories I and know. probably thousands. And so I'm, it's going to be a very focused song, Donna, that's going to re and, and Matt is, he's a great man. And I, I think this is God brought us together for, could be for this purpose for his healing. Cause mm -hmm. I know this touches him a lot. His, that his dad was such a known man and such an outgoing person but it was he never knew him in person but he does know him his dad comes works through him the spirit of his dad so i i i commend you on what you're you know the way you feel about that and i've had a troop commit suicide too who i went through the, i was his team leader going through the entire two-year pipeline of training right um, and he was actually um he it, it was tough for us to get over um it was, it was an accidental they think it was overdose so uh, yeah out of respect for him, I won't, and his family, I won't go any further, but it was really sad to know that he was going through that type of trauma. And, and with the therapy, um, and like myself, thank God I was found and was able to get work on my, you know, my problems. Um, but we want to be able to inter intercept. A lot of people have to hit rock bottom yeah. or, or they're just going to play, play you off and just keep focusing on such things as self-medication mm -hmm. or just containing themselves and being alone in the house. 
uh, and not maybe they're not near a facility or the things just don't line up to get the proper therapy. Um, but anything that we can do that we can catch them before incarceration or suicide. Right. This this is why I'm here. This is yeah. why I sing um, and to help others such as the new single Highway Patrolman that's uh, still sitting at number 54 on the Billboard indicators. Uh, and, and it's it's a song that I wrote and the album was done. And I went to te uh, Texas and was doing a benefit for the Texas Highway Patrol because of all that workload these guys. My gosh, these guys are working like they're deployed in combat. They're wow. working the border. They're working months at a time, no days off. Mm -hmm. And I met this Texas Highway Patrolman who is uh, who has a cerebral palsy son. And every patrolman that I know down there knows two or three guys who've been killed. There was 33 law enforcement officers killed in, in the line of duty in January, 65% up higher than it was last year. And all these guys, I mean, think about the trauma they're going through. And, and this Texas Highway Patrolman has this cerebral palsy son, can't afford a vehicle to get the son out of the house. Oh, geez. The son's stuck in the house. And so I said, you know what? Sit down, let me write with you. So I wrote how Tech, Highway Patrolman right there. Right. Rushed back to Nashville, called the band up, and got Brent Mason and Lonnie Wilson and the guys, Duncan Mullins and Austin Crumb, and got these boys together, and we cut it, and it was the first single. And, you know, some people say it's not the strongest song on the album or, you know, it, but I believed it was a song I wanted to walk into the industry again with mm -hmm. and, and, and to appreciate law enforcement. I know there's a lot of problems that people have with law enforcement right now. And um, but my deal is without <laughs> without security internally, we are not going to be. I mean, people there'll, there'll be no civilization. There'll be no. nothing will be civilized. People will be killing each other in the streets. Yes. It, it, in, I in mean, the, you know what I mean? I, that's already happening, but I'm talking about in mass amounts of numbers, Yeah, you know, like it, literally it, slicing each other up, like, like, right. like it, the it, freaking zombie <laughs> apocalypse. You know what I mean? It'll be the, the great purge. huh? Yes. I mean, so if people it, don't realize that without them, we, we no. have no society. And what these law enforcement need is they need more support. They need the proper funding and they need uh, training. Uh, to limit the amount of accidental shootings is going to come down to training, real life training, scenario training, like we do in special ops. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, they're going to need therapy that if they need to step forward with PTSD from what's going on, more cops are being killed than ever. They, these guys are working 12s, like three weeks in a row, not a day off. They get one day off and they're right back on, you know, 21 day schedule. These guys yeah. are working their tails off. So we have to have some type of therapy there for them. They need to, there, there's, there needs to be a broadening of the mindset of law enforcement yes. at the same time so that these guys are not afraid of getting help because their badge and guns going to be taken away rather than not yeah. getting help. Then they're out there making the wrong decision. Now we got it on the news. A cop did something wasn't supposed to do. Now there are bad cops. There are bad cops. There's bad preachers. There's, there's bad, bad doctors. There's, there's bad, bad, bad attorneys. Everything. Yeah. I, you, just because a man is a cop doesn't mean that there's not going to be bad cops, but mm -hmm. you cannot condemn all law enforcement. Right, right. No, ma'am. That, that that's that's just where you know you. I'm glad you understand. And I yeah, know I do. absolutely understand. I also have uh, you know had many cops in my family. Um, mm -hmm. You are so full of personality, um, oh, thank you. and I don't I don't know if anybody's told you this. Do you want to tell me a little bit about the Jinx tour? What you the refer Jinx? to as the Jinx tour? Yeah. Uh, well, um, yeah, the, the last tour was in Afghanistan. I was the NCOIC of our unit, the non-commissioned officer in charge of our unit. And we had a lot of, a lot of issues went down with that. I went in and um, me and a, a fellow teammate, we got called uh, out of Kandahar and we were doing alert, re uh, rescue alert there in Kandahar for a section of Afghanistan and Uzbekistan, which was another base we were at we uh do the northern part of afghanistan alert rescue right. we are the pararescue team ready to go rescue you know like high intensity rescue in combat both of our aircraft have gal two mini guns off each side eight barrel guns let me guns. interrupt you for a second i actually thought when you were calling it the jinx tour i was thinking that it was a musical tour when oh. you were on curb okay but but i don't i don't want to stop <laughs> you unless you, yeah because i'm thinking music and you're you're back in the military um yeah. but and, and i wasn't there but not that i'm not interested i do have a question about that specifically mm -hmm. when you go out and rescue are you just rescuing uh, uh you know americans or are you rescuing anybody that needs to be rescued if 
it yes it can be americans such as uh my one my second troop another troop i had jason plyatt he was with one of my supervisors mike maltz that i spoke of earlier was killed mm. three months after i got out they were on a mission out of afghanistan kandahar to go rescue two kids who stepped on a landmine oh lord and they crashed in route they hit the top of a mountain and crashed um and it killed everyone of them on impact so yeah we will do we we, we do missions as long as we got a mission we're going to go do if we don't have an operation going on with actual americans and if we're if we tie our assets up assets up in an operation doing something and then seal team here gets hit or a green beret team gets hit mm -hmm. and we are not able to do that so that's a call on upper leadership mm -hmm. to be able to pick whether it's it's something we can do now we want to help the civilian populace and we do civilian rescue rescue missions combat rescue missions there we also rescue the Afghan military. Wow. Uh, but we do center, we're a rescue force that can rescue from all broad ranges, but we're one of the only ones that can go in and rescue intense special operations style missions. Cause we can free fall in from up to 35,000 feet. Mm -hmm. We can repel in, we can come down with a Stokes basket off the side of helicopter. We're all combat medics trained at the highest level. I was level. gonna ask you that, do you, uh, you, do you have medical training? Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, we, we, we carry whole blood with us. We actually infuse person to person from our body. We we can transfuse. Uh, from our yeah, body. I understand what that is. Do you do you um have you thought about working in the medical field home because, here because you probably could right? Yeah, a lot of a lot of PJs, pararescues, jumpers. They come out and they become doctors, MDs, mm -hmm. um, or they become uh, PA, the trauma PAs. I well, to be honest paramedics, with you, right? What about paramedics? Well, we carry the qualification. All pararescue men carry the National Registry paramedic qualification. Right. Uh, we just take it a step further because in combat, we are the doctors. Mm -hmm. We are the docs on the ground. There is no doctor sitting there going, uh, yeah, you can chest tube him now. So no, it's we, almost we, like a demotion if you became a paramedic. <laughs> well, it, it no, actually, is, right? Well, it, 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 I would say it, it, I mean, it depends on how you look at it. Uh, right. Because... Paramedic is our is is our qualification training in the National Registry, but for for combat, for search and rescue, for operations, you know, it's because we can't we can't just go grab a doctor and go, OK, hey, let's put you through free fall school and combat. Right. Diving. We have to go through a long, extensive three to four month indoctrination, which is a major washout rate. We started with over 100 people and got down to 12 very fast in three weeks. Uh, you go through a full hell week. You're in the pool 12 hours a day. They're rocking you, man. You, 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 para, para rescue are really good in the water. One of our best skills. So it, to be able to do that and be down range, you might go do a chest tube to reinflate a lung. You might right. have to do a cricothyroidotomy. Mm -hmm. You might have to do a super pubic needle cystotomy to relieve a bladder. You might have to amputate. Yeah. Um, the, the thing about para, that I would say about combat medics that make them very good at what we do is we do a lot of live tissue um, to where animals have been donated by science who are dying. And we work with those animals. We understand certain things um, so that when we get into combat, the first times our hands is involved in a life that responds to compensated, decompensated shock. We understand it. So the biggest thing of understanding in combat is how to triage how to understand what your survivor, what this individual is going through. Are they, law, are they in internal bleeding? Mm -hmm. Are they in compensated or decompensated shock? Understanding the two types of shock is what's gonna lead you to do the right medical treatment. Right. And that's the advanced medical training. Uh, that way you're not stalling. We always say, if you stall, you're wrong. You're dead, they're dead. Yeah. Uh, you commit to your decision. You commit, you commit, commit. Um, and and I wouldn't be honest with the answer question, Donna. And I appreciate you asking that. But I I'm I left that. Um, that is, I return uh, still a part of who I am. Right. And I'm Donovan. I was Donovan before I came into military. I'm Donovan now, um, and I have a different gift that was has been blessed to mm -hmm. me. As long as I keep my mind right, or it can be take. It's been shown to me really quick where I had to rebuild my throat and sing. Took a year to talk and sing again. It took me a year and a half to play guitar with that hand again, wow. and I'm back. Uh, but it can be taken away from me real fast. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's to stay focused and and to stay with my gift. And me medical, you have to stay current in so much, Donna. Yeah. 
Well, you know, our life, and, and this isn't just for you or just for me, this is for everybody. I really find that life sometimes leads you down different paths, um, you know, and, and so like, you know, I did paralegal for 16 years. I don't do it anymore, but I take, I use everything that I've ever done and everything that I've ever learned in today, in my life today. And I'm sure you would too, if you were out at the mall and you saw somebody mm -hmm. uh, having a medical issue that you knew mm -hmm. you could take care of right then, I'm sure you'd do it. Yes, ma'am. It never leaves you. Like if you saw something going on or someone said something like a, uh, a something, you know, about paralegal that no, yeah. no, no, under, under state, you know, blah, 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 blah. You could straighten them out real quick. But no, if someone if something happened and there's a lot of times where accidents happen where I will pull over and I can give the paramedics come up. I'm already telling them what's going on, going, hey, and right. like, I'm former pararescue and paramedic. OK, what do we got? And help in that way, you know, it, it never leaves you when it's beat into you like for 16 years of what you did and for the years of my career, it never leaves you because yeah. you have to become a professional at another level with it. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but it sets up our standard of how we live our life in a way, but doesn't consume us and who we are forward. And, and, and you know, like they said in uh, rehabilitations, we die every night to become a new person every morning. Mm -hmm. Ta they say, undo yourself. You take your clothes off, undo yourself with your clothes, get in that bed and just let it go. And don't yeah, undo your day it. shed Un shed, yeah. shed it get rid of it you know let's take it off yeah, let's take it. <laughs> yeah no really i mean i get that i get that 100 percent. okay so you, you're you are going to crs um did i ask you if the, again you're like number seven for me today <laughs> did, did i ask you if this is your first one no uh no it's not my you didn't but it's not my first one okay. i i was at Oh three, oh four, I think oh five, and then I was at two of them when I was on category five. So I think I've been through five of them at least. Um, CRS. Oh, but this, is this your first time at the Omni? Because they used to be at Renaissance. It is. I, yeah, so we're not going to have the big tree bar collage going on this time. <laughs> well, actually, this is. It's they put a. They put. It's beautiful. It's. It's like. It's like top shelf. So, I mean, you, it's impressive is what I'm trying to say. The reason why I'm doing these interviews this way is because I can really talk to who mm -hmm. I'm talking, you know, who I, I, it's so fast paced and everybody's flashing by. And, I, and then by the time I get all of the assets together and, and by the way, today's a lot different. And, you know, again, like the music industry is so mm -hmm. different today than it was in 2003. Oh my gosh, it is. It's. I'm I'm trying to catch up right now, even to when I left it in 2009, 2010, I left category five. I'm trying to catch it. Oh, nine. Yeah, I'm trying to catch up to what it is now. And um, uh, I, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. I remember what, like going through the booths, right? It's like a publicist is like, OK, get in this booth. And then it's like people <laughs> talking and I'm sitting there in the booth and then Red Akins is popping his head out behind a curtain with a turkey cock. <laughs> What's up, Donovan? I'm like, dude, what are you doing? Yeah, I mean, I can remember that. And yeah, Rhett was always messing with me at CRS like that. But yeah, it's a, it was really jammed in there, man. You you guys were doing the best you could with a lot of talking going on, you know, and artists in quick, like changing over every 30 minutes. I mean, it's like, how do you get into the artists and get to know them? And how do they get to know you? And, and, and personalities click and emotions transfer. Yeah. You know, commu proper communication. Yeah, you don't get any of that. And and I find and well, sometimes it's it's immediate and sometimes you do get that, but it, it lasts. It's fleeting because, you know, they're on to the next interview. Your 10 minutes is up. Boom. That's it. And, and they're being dragged away. And you're like, but but but, you know, and you don't even get the question <laughs> answered. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, and then by the time you get everything typed up and, and all done, it's two, three, four, five weeks after CRS. And it's like, and you almost feel like no one is even going to care now. This is so old. That's right. It's old news. And, mm -hmm. you know, we were talking earlier and I meant to say this to you, and this is so terrible, but I'm going to tell you two things about mm -hmm. journalism, about the, uh, the, and it's not just America, it's, it's worldwide. Two things is, and is as a journalist, one of our sayings is if it bleeds, it reads. How gross is that? That's one saying. The second one is, as we develop our articles and on with online publications, and I'm the editor of three uh, pretty popular online publications, with these online publications, we have a template or a format we work inside of, and we are told to dumb it down. We are told. Now, listen to what I said. It'll if it say, reads, it bleeds, but dumb it down. 
Right. So if that's why they want, you know, it's always like when you say there's no good news, so there isn't any good news because nobody cares about good news. It's the way that we have become the civilization that we are is just, it's disgusting. People, I want, I, you know, I want to read happy stuff. I want to know happy stuff. The reason why TikTok became so famous so uh, and so popular so quickly was because when it first started, all you saw was puppies, kittens, and babies. It was the happy it zone. Now. It was the happy zone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's now changing. And mm -hmm. that's sad. That's sad. And I, I you know, and I kind of went off it because I saw the changes beginning and I was like, what's happening to my happy place? No, mm -hmm. no. Just like Facebook, the first couple of years, I was probably one of the first, you know, first hundred thousand people to have a Facebook account back in 2008. You know, and it was like when no one even knew what Facebook was, I had an account and maybe visited it once every two weeks. And maybe there'd be a few people that asked me to be a friend. You know, but it, it was, and before that, it was MySpace. Do you remember MySpace? Oh yeah, MySpace. <laughs> that went, 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 it went and did good. We all had MySpace accounts when we went on our last tour, I think, or right when we got back. But then it went away real quick. Facebook. And, well, my, MySpace was really geared toward the music artist. It was really geared toward that. But yeah, it didn't last that long. And then it kind of Facebook. And I saw the the stuff happening with Facebook. And um, what I, what I want to do with you right now is I want I want to focus, you know, for like the last two minutes that uh -huh. we're taping on what you want everybody to know about what you have coming up. And then I want to go off the record with you. OK. OK, so tell me we, we you've got uh, CRS coming up. You're going to be there one day. Yes, ma'am. One day at CRS on the 25th. Right. And then where can people see you perform and tell us about your website and all of that? Uh, well, the next performance we have right now in the books where I'm headlining is is a big Vietnam and Afghanistan veteran show on May 6th at Valley Fest in Dunlap, Tennessee, that Freedom Sings is doing in accordance to Valley Fest. We're starting the Friday night, so it'll be a three day event rather than a two. And Freedom Sings will do every Friday of every, every year from here forward. Um, we've got great support on it from sponsors with Coca-Cola. Um, they're, they're working. My, our team at Freedom Sings has got a great event, but I will be there headlining. Half the band that'll be playing uh, backing me is Eddie Montgomery's band. So it's really cool. Eddie's oh, like, cool. Yeah, he's like, use my boys, man. Bring my boys out there. So, <laughs> okay. so, so yeah, so we got some great musicians. We've got Loretta Lynn's bass player, Michael Lusk, who sang background on the album. So I hope you, people can come out and hear it. It's a veterans event. We're going to have um, several bands from Nashville there, other bands. Um, and uh, my website is donovanchapman.com. And you can watch the new video to the new single. I would love people to watch Highway Patrolman, uh, the new single video on YouTube, um, and check it out. And we also have a video called uh, Broken Heroes of a 20-Year War that I sang on for Freedom Sings. Um, and it was, it was counseled by veterans from Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan about what we truly felt when what happened mm. um, from the military, the way the pullout happened after what we did there and, and the people who are suffering still. Um, so, I mean, I really appreciate you having me here, Donna. And, um, but that's one event that we have coming. There will be many more events that will be coming up this year because we're really working hard on expanding. Um, and and the more people I can meet like you who have a beautiful heart, a beautiful soul and spirit, who care about civilization, who care about people, who don't get lost in left or right or this and that, who just looks at life and just goes, hey, you know, I miss puppies. <laughs> Me too. I miss kittens and puppies on TikTok. You know, I miss funny things and things that make us laugh. Uh, let's get out of the anger mind. Let's get out of the point and victim mind, pointing the finger victim mind. Because when you're looking with fear and anger, you're only going to notice fear and anger. You're not even going to see the person next to you who's a loving person who wants to, you know, you can communicate with. We can only communicate with the mindset that we're used to thinking in. And when we create them neural nets up there like that, mm -hmm. and they all bond together in that way of thinking, then that's your product. You are, yeah, that's what you're going to be in your life. Yeah. Um, so I hope that people in this civilization and I, and the reason why I think that your God sent Donna and what you do is, is because one thing I learned in medical is what the, what comes in the ears is three times more potent on the mind, emotional mind than any other sensory organ. And that's why music is so important so that we can help society. And that's what I try to do with my music is, to help people open their minds to love and acceptance. 
and, and, and appreciating this valuable life, this beautiful thing we have down here. And the earth, as a native Hawaiian, mm-hmm. protect the earth, protect your environment. Do not throw litter, do not trash the earth. Respect everything. It is a life that contains a creator spirit, just like we do. Mm-hmm. It is our earth and we don't have another one. And that's another passionate thing of mine as a native Hawaiian. Well, thank you so much for talking to me and um, I look forward to hearing you in the future. Thank you so much, Donna.